the abuse of a child is undoubtedly a dreadful and unforgivable act, which should be condemned at all levels. But when a child is murdered, it becomes even more painful and unforgivable. Tragedy today in Ormond Town, Central Kingston. A four-year-old was killed and by a man he as well as his family knew. The lifeless body of the four-year-old lay in the middle of the road, the police tape separating him from the huge crowd that had gathered as word spread of the shooting. Trudy Ann Brown remembered her last conversation with her son. I said yesterday, I said, Mommy, you know something now, but I turn a pilot. I got to turn a soldier. I turned to him and said, No, baby, don't turn a soldier. Turn a pilot, please, my baby, because them love to kill police and soldiers. And he said, No, Mommy, I have to turn a soldier. I'm going to buy you a look house and buy my father a big house and buy my grandmother a bigger house than you know. For years we have seen and heard the awful stories of children being killed. At the time this documentary was completed, over 40 children were already murdered in Jamaica in 2015. Among them was 14-year-old Santoya Campbell. The post-mortem conducted this afternoon on the body of 14-year-old Santoya Campbell concluded she died from suffocation. It's a sad state when a country begins to turn on the youths. Santoya's body was found under a bridge near her school in Froome, Westmoreland in early 2015. She was strangled. Cornelius Robinson, otherwise called Mark, a married businessman, has been convicted for her murder. It is reported that the child was in a relationship with Robinson and got pregnant. He subsequently killed her. Inspector Hilaire Jeffrey Henderson of the Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse brought it to our attention that the police got reports that Robinson was allegedly giving money to young Santoya to keep her quiet. A case in Westmoreland where the child was killed and her body was found in a bag under the bridge. The allegations that we are here coming out is that um, the parent had asked this man to help out, and he was in fact helping out. But after a while, he claimed that the child was extorting him. Now we're getting tired of the child because it is said that the child got pregnant and an abortion was done. On the second pregnancy, the man also wanted her to abort this child and she decided no. She would go to his place of business and she would want, want, want all the time because that was what she was accustomed to, getting things that the parent could not afford to give her. So he got really fed up and he decided that he was going to end her life and that was what he did. And he, when, he, when he was taken into custody, he, was, um, he pled guilty and in a matter of weeks, the matter was finished. He pled guilty and he was sentenced. Inspector Jeffrey Henderson says Sissoka has had numerous cases where mothers would use their daughters to get financial help from older men. Our team journeyed to Shrewsbury, Westmoreland to speak with Pauline Ferguson, the mother of Santoya, and to see how the family was coping. Uh, Co-op. It's, it's really hard to get over, but uh, we are still trying to get over by the help of the Almighty God. Yeah. You know, but it's hard to get over. We also sought to find out if she knew that Santoya and Robinson were intimately involved, and if the teenager was in fact taking money from the businessman. Take money from who? The, the perpetrator. To, to come to who, who, who give, when he get the money, who he give? I have no idea. I don't know about the money. If, he, if she was getting money, I don't know about it. I wasn't receiving any money from the person, from that perpetrator. You understand me? Pauline Ferguson says Cornelius Robinson is someone she has known for years. In fact, he grew up in the same community and would come to their home from time to time. But at no time did he and Santoya show any signs that they were intimately involved. So he just came by, and when he came by, he did not even talk to me, ma'am, Santaya. He always talked to the bigger ones. They come there and he say, oh, Sant um, Shanika, how are you doing? You're not working as yet, and they will talk. I never see um, Mark and Santaya 
tuck it in my sight. When he came, Santaya always inside of the room. Ari, she drawn at the back of wash her school clothes. No sign. No sign of talking. So if they communicate, communicate, it was on the phone because Santaya have a little phone that made it by her. Miss Ferguson maintains that Santoya was getting money from an older brother in England and there was no reason for the family to take money from Robinson. She also told us that neither she nor anyone else in the family saw any signs of Santoya's pregnancy, even though an autopsy has revealed that she was five months pregnant at the time she was killed. She further underscored that at the time of her death, Santoya was still active in sports at school. So in, in retrospect, you know, in hindsight, just looking back, you didn't see any kind of difference that she started no, acting different? No, anyway. no, no difference. Never started coming in later? Um, um, she coming in like 5.30, come to like brown dust. But she called me, she always called me, Mommy, I can't get no taxi as yet, so I am done by the taxi stand. Other residents of the community also told us that news that the young woman and the businessman were sexually involved came as a shock to them. Nobody do. We don't look for that. Right near St. Lago, the little child just did, so we don't look for that. You know, my first time this happened just like that. Isn't it me? So it's shocking to all that people. Shocking to me too. The identity of Santoya's murderer came as a greater shock to the community as Cornelius Robinson was seen as a mild-mannered Christian. Most residents we spoke with said he would have been one of the last persons to be suspected of abusing a child, let alone murder. So you see a man and I know him inside it, man. <laughs> you don't know, you don't know. Because him, I, even him that them said them like, I don't know because to me, he's like a Christian guy. I don't know, this man said everything just crazy. For Carl Robinson, Cornelius' father, the entire episode is beyond shocking. He still cannot come to terms with the fact that his son is a child abuser and worst, a child murderer. He can talk to me about what type of person Mark was. Did you expect that, expect him to do that? Until now, I can't say my son to you know, my boss. Oh, you don't believe he was one no, of these? No. So who do you think did it? I, I couldn't tell you who did it, but to me, I have no belief that yeah, I did it. You just find it hard to believe that he did hard it? Hard to believe. You suspect that somebody is doing it? Yeah, somebody involved in that thing. So you can't believe that he did it? No, believe he died in the cover up with somebody and take the blame for it, but I don't believe I did it. So you saw no signs Say, that no. would indicate that he was a child of abuser? No, no, sir. The man who go to church, baptized a Christian man, go to church up to every Sunday and gone. Faith fellowship in a man to go be him go to church. So, he shock everybody. He say involve and mix up with things like that. Um, Mark, Mark our, our father to everybody, even me where I'm father, in council me every day. Can't believe say involved. Especially with them the people. Eh? <laughs> oh, them the people. Eh? Oh, yeah. okay. Angela Robinson, Cornelius' mother, is obviously still grieving. She says she mourns the death of Santoya and the fact that her only son is now in prison. He's, you know, when you have somebody where you know say he's a good person, kind hearted, and all of that, after you see all of this happen, it's a shocker to all of us. You understand? We can't believe. We can't believe. So sometimes we don't know if we think I'm at a last. I, I know the whole situation. As you see, we are our neighbors. We are neighbors. She grew up, she, we, we, uh, this is the community that I born and growing. Both of them. We live like family. Some of your sister them, that are the mother. Her sister is still called my mother aunt. So we are family. So we live good with, with everything. So this come down like a like a hurricane, a bad situation. He just lick, take us by storm. Lick me man, pain me heart, everything. Me, me not, me not inside, both sides are the same thing. You little girl, me and she move good, said we. 
every wall of my mouth go, then come on my house when they're ready. Mm -hmm. They never pass me. Morning, Miss Maxine. Good morning, Miss Maxine. We tell him good morning. He's not a bad person, like I said. You mean what I'm a brute, and you mean what I'm cruel and wicked and all of that. So when all of this happened, he really hit me hard. Hit me hard. Sorry, for your mother said we. Still stunning. Still, yes, man. If body, 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 we don't know what he tell us. Eh? But Christ said we. As a mother, it must, it yes, must man. be pain. Christ said we. I don't eat my food, I feel. I miss him. I was him one nice, good, loving, somebody caring. Somebody who can depend upon. If they mother, if they wish to talk to you, he might be my friend. He might be my good, good friend. The Robinsons' description of their son highlights that an abuser or worse, a killer, does not have to be a known thug, pervert, or criminal. He or she could be someone highly respected, trusted, and adored by their family, community, and the rest of the society. The warning is therefore clear. Just about anyone could be an abuser, and any child could become a victim. How did you raise him? How was he brought up? In church? In church. We used to go up, 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 he was a team leader, <coughs> he was a warrior, he come back here, same way, same thing, he start up, he, we have a citizen association, but he went, um, discontinue, and I try to start it back, he, he is not a bad person, but, um, as you know, sometimes, you know, everybody can deal with stress. As when sometimes I stress upon the way do foolishness, not you. So, sometimes I me mean, just, just leave everything in a God hand. I don't want to say nothing if it did come down for me. I say, I'm going to talk against them or whatever. You understand me? So, some light time, I don't say nothing. I just, just, just want. Sometimes I want me to feel like I have no clothes. I don't mean, eat. I'm not bitter. I can't go up and come down. I just go out and drink. Tears slowly swim to her eyes. And sadly she sits and sighs. So far as we know, it is the cold hearted, cowardly actions of Cornelius that caused the death of Santoya. The self-confessed murderer obviously had a dark side not many people knew. It is this uncontrollable dark side which has landed him in prison and has regrettably sent young Santoya to an early grave in a section of the Shrewsbury community. It's getting dark, too dark to see. I feel like knocking on a heaven's door. You are watching part two of Cries of the Innocent, TVJ's look at child abuse in Jamaica. When we return, we journey to St. Thomas to speak with the relatives of a pregnant child who was also viciously murdered. Welcome back to Cries of the Innocent. Like Westmoreland, St. Thomas is another parish where the cases of child abuse is very high. We visited the community of Newlands, once home to Kay Alicia Simpson. Similar to Santoya, Kay Alicia was 14 years old, a victim of child abuse and five months pregnant when she was killed. The Donald Quarry High School student was chopped to death and her mangled body found behind her home in Newland, St. Thomas. The boyfriend of one of her aunts has been taken into custody in connection with the gruesome murder. We visited the home of her grandmother, Eloise Brown, who was also her guardian. She too has been grappling with the loss of young Kay Alicia. And there have been reports that she, she had reached out to members of her family to say that she, she was being abused. No, 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 no. So no one knew she was being abused? No, because... Um, 
she never spoke of it. And she never acted in a way of such. I know nothing of it. No one suspected it? Nobody brought it here? No, no, no one, no person at all has ever brought anything of such to my attention. In our research, we get a sense that majority of the cases mm -hmm. of abuse, the perpetrators, are family members or people who should be protecting the young, the young people, especially the young girls. And there is this loss of trust. You know, no, none of my family members has ever done anything no. harmful to my child, Talisa. None. I would never stand up for that. And if I had known that thing, so that if I go that way, man, it make me tell you, man, don't him would go a long time. Yeah. Out. I mean, no watch my police station there. I know who got to. The police is, there are people who I can't trust. I can't go to them at midnight when I call them there. So what make if me know say something like that happened, me would hide it. Me couldn't hide that. That's that my baby. Everything me work from that is she. Me put it towards her. Eh? I know it won't be long. That change has got to go. That change has got to go. And I know that it won't be. It's a nationwide thing. It's a nationwide thing. Everybody have to come together. Everybody have to come together for this boat going down. It's going down. It's going down and we need to uplift it and bring it up back up and stand. Yeah? And the little one them have to come. They must come. And all of them man they will walk around and rape people, pick me and take them and go kill them. They have to find them. They must find them. They must bring to justice. Not one, but the whole of them. The whole of them. As in Santoya's case, no one we spoke with in Kealicia's community said they saw any signs that she was being molested. Neither did they see any signs that she was five months pregnant. Did she show any signs of being no abused? No signs. No signs. She didn't say anything? No signs. That's why, you know, it's us when they... Is it a case where there's, there was nobody in the family that she could have, you know, come and talk to? Or was it that... Yeah, we were there, but I don't know why she chose not to talk because we were like people like we can sit and talk to, you know? We can reason with, so... I don't know how, because even me and her did roll together good, so I don't know. She went about school, or did you see any like any changes in her grades? Anything? No, grades were up there. I tell her grades were up there. Up there, same way as she studied, same way. So, as I say, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. No signs. She laughs, she talks, she dances, she do basically. Wait. Normal person, Kay Alicia's uncle Chadwin Atkinson is still searching for answers. If 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 I did suspect him, this would have never taken place. What does happen? He made have to leave if me didn't even suspect. He made have to leave same time. But if I tell you the truth, me never suspect it. We posed questions to the families and members of both communities as to what can be done to protect our children, especially since child abuse is sometimes so hard to detect. Like one each other, um, look out for each other's children. Yeah. And if they suspect anything that, you know, that is abnormal, they should like pay keen attention and, you know, try to find out what is the problem and be more alert. As men, especially in rural communities like this, what can be done to be more vigilant against child abuse and to be more protective of children, especially in cases where there are little or no signs? What do you think needs to be done? Well, we need to pay more attention to our children. We um, need to know their whereabouts. And where they are at night, where they um, check up on the time school over and the time they should reach home and look out for other children, not just our own. 
but did you hear anybody saying, you know, a kind of figure, something that go on, or, you know, but it's suspected, you know, hear nobody say that even after it, the whole thing? Well, no. Not, 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 in, no. I didn't hear anyone say that. What do you think can be done from the governmental level? What do you think can be done? What would you want to see the government doing to ensure that we protect our children against, our, our children are protected against child abuse? Well, the only thing I can see eh, is more harsh punishment when they catch the culprit them that did it so that who out there plan to do it, them just no, no one do it again. For Marva Sutherland, a retired teacher, it is very painful as she saw Kaelissa grow and believes the young lady had a promising future. We needn't take things for granted, seeing that what is happening around us. You understand? We cannot take these things for granted. We have to be more vigilant, we have to question them, we have to be aware of what is happening. You understand? Carl Robinson also believes parents need to be more observant of what is happening with their children. If them daughters, them daughters come in with height, phone, height, and you know, you know, you know, you're 40. When you get in our school, you send him go big, big time around there to help. Then think they break down the St. Pitney Street. Some right. people must just live up and take care of them children and stop sending children to piss people out there. Because everywhere you go, you find this begging, begging and it take. Because if me did, then strong, maybe me that fall in and then said trap the thing. Start from the womb. Mother and father must turn up. You get a child, take care of your pitney. No making you have a second power there. We put the same question to Cornelius' mother and also asked her how we can raise children to be more respectful and protective of others and not be abusive. How would you think, you know, what would you, your suggestion be to parents to, to, to protect their children and to, to grow up their, their children in, in ways to ensure that they don't become abusers? Like I tell you something. Yes, if I need first day born. When he any bad, me said, me say, God, I gave him to you like oh Hannah, give you Samuel. Use him for your glory. You understand me? So me grew up in a church, in grew in a church, he never quarrel. He never fight, me never come and come miss me in the quarrel and cause and fight. I saw him grow, he grow good, he live good with everybody. What what can families do to ensure that they don't, you know, they protect our children. Well, let me tell you something. The only thing, the only thing we have to do for, for may, may God say, we be good parents, but may God stay look for myself and say, me I want good parents and me grow good and all of this happen. You understand? To ensure say, you look about the well-being of your children. You see, you can, you can, you can as a parents. We have to know how we children go to school. Every step where they have, we hold it, how they get, how they come by, everything where they have, and you are the provider, right? So, um, my children are supposed to have no give them. We have to investigate how they get it. You see? And me now can go ask you, me see you then, and me go ask you, say, you can help me send me, give me some lunch money for my daughter, my son, or whatever. We have to ensure that me go go look for work and send them to school, not true? And provide for them. Pauline Ferguson believes there's need for divine intervention. We just have to put children, um, just ask the Lord to cover the children them of today. Because we are living in a time of, I don't even know what to tell you. Um, people that have no heart, people who do not consider it nobody at all. So I would just ask parents to just, whenever time their children are going out, just pray and just say, God, cover my children.
speak to parents that they must have their eyes out more and even the community should watch over other else people, children or whatever they can do. They understand me. You know, don't if we see anything going on and they know that is wrong, they should be able to get to, to somebody who can work with it. And say, okay, you know, I see something that looks strange. So take a stand. And if it's not one thing, it's another. You're watching Cries of the Innocent, TVJ's look at child abuse in Jamaica. When we return, we speak with officials from government and non-governmental organizations about ridding the society of child abuse. Welcome back to Cries of the Innocent, TVJ's look at child abuse in Jamaica. The statistics from the Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse reveal that in 2014, there were 510 reports of the raping of children under 16 years old. 324 were committed by adults. What is frightening is that only about 10% of child abuse cases are believed to be reported. Inspector Elaire Jeffrey Henderson tells us that Sissoka gets many reports of sexual grooming of young girls by adult males. When we go to schools and we talk to children, especially males, they are telling us that their peers would prefer to talk to a person who is an adult. You know, these adults can offer them something that their peers cannot offer them. It might be a free ride to school, it might be lunch money, it might be phone cards, it might just be a lunch or clothing, something that their parents cannot afford. So they look for, the, look for these things from older men. Some of our reports indicate that a mother or a grandmother might ask an older person to help out, help out, and that is where the abuse started to take place. The inspector points to the breakdown of the Jamaican family as the main reason for the high incidence of child abuse, especially sexual abuse. Get back to the days where they say it takes a village to raise a child. We need to get back to that. Um, we need you to report all suspected cases of abuse. Um, start disciplining in the home. Don't just allow the teachers and police officers to, to carry out discipline with your children. The police and the teachers alone cannot do it. Start discipline in the home. Parents should be the first educators of sexuality to their children because when it is being taught by somebody else, it might not go the right way. It might, it might not come out how it is supposed to to be and children can children are easily influenced by whatever adults are saying to them sometimes when when victims come to Sissoka or when you have a one-on-one -on -one with them things are terrible at home they are seeing a lot of things they are seeing older siblings having sex with their with their um, boyfriends they are seeing parents having sex they are witnessing verbal abuse they are witnessing physical abuse. They are not going to school regularly. So most of it is coming from the home base. Things are not right at home. So children do act out. They do act out. Lisa Hanna is the minister in charge of youth. It's a range of issues. One, it's children over time being neglected by parents, children who have had to parent themselves. Um, children who are not in a situation where they have a strong family foundation. And so we have to start having some hard conversations as communities because typically what happens is when the child is abused or is murdered, then the community will say, well, we knew, or somebody in the family says, well, we knew. And that has to stop. I, I, I said in my sectoral, look, there, there comes a point where every... Everybody has to sit up and take notice. We're seeing what 
a family of multiple partners has on a child. We're seeing mothers who pawn out their daughters and their sons. We're seeing situations where there's just tremendous neglect and people not taking responsibility for having children. Now, these are not things that people readily want to hear, but this is a fact. We've gotten to a point in this country where the value systems of what our responsibilities are in terms of, of caring for and protecting children, and somehow there are some who feel, well, the government is to do everything about it. Well, the government has the policies in place. We have the legislation. If someone rapes a child or rapes somebody, they can get life imprisonment. It's up to the judge to use their discretion. But at the end of the day, if something happens to a child, who is coming forward to give the evidence? The children feel such guilt in terms of thinking that they're going to lock up a member of their family. This is a culture that has happened in Jamaica over time. The incest, because we have parishes now when we're looking at the reports, because remember now, you know, we've, we've really just as a country started to collect the data and collect the reports. So we've moved up in terms of reporting significantly. The Office of the Children's Registry, we can track the data to see which parishes. Sexual abuse, up. Incest, it's right there in certain parishes. Um, St. Thomas and St. Mary and West Milan. And what happens when you speak to the children is they do say when they speak to their mothers or their grandmothers, they say, well, we, it did happen to we and we turn out fine, but they actually didn't. They've carried that, that shame with them and they transfer it to the children. And a lot of the children, when you see children acting out, it's because of the post-traumatic stress. It puts such a burden on them and this, our psychologists are seeing it, it puts such a burden on them that some of them push it away and it acts out in other ways in terms of violent behavior at school. They can't resolve conflict. And it also highly sexualizes them. So if a child is being molested, they end up in complicit and illicit sexual liaisons too early in life. They have bad relationships. They end up having sex with, to feel a sense of love or perhaps because they are accustomed to it. And so all of this is just a cycle. Ms. Hannes says the government will be seeking more stringent measures to deal with child abusers. She maintains that the laws are in place and families need to report cases of child abuse, including where the perpetrators are family members or friends. She noted that under her watch, there will be zero tolerance for child abusers in children's homes and state-run facilities. I can tell you as a minister with responsibility for children's homes, Anyone that has been suspected of abusing a child is inter interdicted right away. We don't, we don't tolerate it. And we, we, we investigate them and we make sure that that staff member is no longer in the particular facility. And also, if the staff member is aware of other wards of the state abusing another ward of the state, there also the CDA also steps in and makes sure that that does not find its way to happen again. We have a very zero-tolerant approach where that is concerned. Patricia Watson and Joy Crawford of e for life believe that there's a culture of child abuse in Jamaica and the country needs to purge itself of it. They support the view that the community needs to be more caring and vigilant when it comes to the welfare of children. I do believe that in all of these agencies to do even more, the general community and the society have to get on board. Because if we're not breaking the silence, if we're not doing the reports, if we're not um, giving the evidence, they can't do their work. If the government is not putting, and the private sector, not putting more money into child protection, they can do so much and no more. I do believe that all of these agencies um, have their mandate. I think that they understand their mandate. I do think that they have great people on their teams. And I do believe that there are people in some of these offices that really should not be there. But we recognize that I do believe that we're on, a, on the right path. I don't think as a society we, 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 have been able, we are able to, 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 to see the, the trauma that, that these young girls go through and how powerless they are in the whole, in, in, in the, the whole situation. These, these are adults, they are adults who are, are doing this. It's a, whole, it's a power, this is somebody who is powerful. 
and violating somebody else who, who, who is weak. And so we, because of the way our society is set up, we tend to blame the little girls who may, because they're expressing their sexuality, they dress, they want to look pretty, they put on a tight skirt, they put on a tight, tight jean, but that's, that's just part of growth and development. We don't see it that way, we see that the girl bad and she want man. You're watching Cries of the Innocent, TVJ's look at child abuse in Jamaica. When we return, the children's advocate and the children's registrar weigh in. We will be back in a moment. Welcome back to Cries of the Innocent. There has been much talk of the village becoming more involved in the raising of children. But at least one of the child abuse survivors we spoke with doesn't believe the solution rests with the village. Nikisha says there are too many strange characters among the village people. And when all is said and done, everything should be in the hands of the family, especially parents. People normally say that the community should raise a child, but the community can't raise a child because everybody, every mind is going to have a different opinion pertaining to that child and that child is going to probably get confused. So protecting a child is a very broad, 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 broad concept because there are times you're going to have to allow that child to seek out on its own. But in terms of family-wise and home-wise, you can in some aspects protect your child, so to say. But my message would be to just educate your child. Don't trust any and everybody around your child. Ensure that whoever, if it is that you have to leave your child to do jobs or run a little errand and stuff like that, ensure that the person can be trusted. And yes, even if I trust the person, anything can happen. Any card can play. So the key to it is just educate your child that, look, if uncle touch her this way, it's not right. And if you touch her that way, you need to tell somebody, you need to come to me, you need to talk to me. Children's advocate Diane Gordon Harrison believes Jamaica has to reach a point where children's rights become commonplace. She maintains it's something that both government and civil society need to confront through sustained, powerful public education campaigns. I do think that we have made some strides. Um, if you have dialogues with persons in different sectors of society, in different types of professions, you will never find all of them being aware of children's rights, but you will find some of them being aware, and I dare say some of them who weren't so aware 10 years ago. We've had discussions, for example, surrounding this very topical issue you know, of corporal punishment and the correct way to raise a child and you know, to inculcate discipline and so on. And persons who are now grandparents have said, you know, I'm not going to lie. When I was a parent and also when I was a child in Jamaica years ago, it was commonplace and it was the norm that children need to be slapped in order to, treat, to, to teach them the right way to do things. They have now said, 40, 60 years later, that they're not going to blame their parents because that's what their parents knew at that time. But with how we have evolved and the more conversations they hear about the rights of children, the fact that children really shouldn't be assaulted, the fact that you shouldn't break a child's hand if you think the child was, you know, um, too rude, the fact that you shouldn't let a child go to bed without dinner for five days as punishment, they are now aware in and of themselves and their grandchildren are benefiting from this now new knowledge that children really are people in their own right and just as how an adult wouldn't like somebody to box them in the face if they said no I'm not going to do this a child really should benefit from that kind of respect. We need to get to that stage where we recognize the importance of child rights, we recognize the importance of the different institutions that have been set up, and we recognize why it is they have been set up, because it's not by accident. And if we recognize a lot of times that the root of our problems as a society go right back to poor family values sometimes, lack of adequate supervision and therefore the inability of children who are not being given the guidance to function appropriately in society, then we will start getting it right. Because in my firm view, if you do 
a detailed analysis, for example, of those persons who are recruited in gangs from very young, those teenage boys, a lot of them come from situations where there's no family connection, there's no proper guidance, there's no adequate supervision, so they're ready for the taking. If we look at some of the girls that we see on our TVs going missing a lot, a lot of them suffer from the same ills, i.e. lack of adequate supervision at home, lack of that kind of family connection where they have a yearning to stay at home because, you know, persons are there who care for them. But, um, you know, we need to, I think, rewrite the script and recognize that we can't keep doing the same thing the same way year after year and expect a different reaction or result. When you're talking about changing mindset, changing culture, having really meaningful paradigm shifts that will impact how persons behave, we have to recognize that that's a process and it's something that's going to take time. But I don't think we should be disheartened and not bother to start. So the process has to start in a very forceful way where there is some strategy that is developed to almost take over the mindset of people. What psychologists will tell you, and I don't pretend to be one because my background is legal, is that if you say something often enough and you model behavior that will influence how persons respond to you often enough and consistent enough, then you will start seeing a change in the attitude and a change in the behavior. And my firm view is if we have these conversations enough, if we have them in the targeted ways that we need to have those messages related, then you will start seeing perhaps an awakening more of consciousness so that yes, you'll have somebody in the household who intends to do something, but they're so surrounded by those who are right-minded that the environment to have them actually act out that negative intention is not as enabling as it would be, as opposed to a scenario where nobody in the house cares, nobody in the house has heard anything, and so it's a lot easier for that individual who intends to perpetuate the abuse to do so successfully. So I think we need to have those strategic messages loudly, clearly, and consistently. The Children's Registrar, Greg Smith, shares similar sentiments. He says the Office of the Children's Registry has been doing its part to keep our children safe, but far more needs to be done. What we have done recently is also trained over 100 persons in search and rescue protocol. How is it that when a child goes missing within the various geographical areas, what are the steps that need to be taken and first aid training also being given? So right now the OCR, we're trying to build our, our cadre of volunteers who will work with us. Uh, we're not taking them out of their regular duties. For example, children's officers who works at CD or the nurse at the hospital who wants to volunteer who have signed up with us. During the course of your duty, if a child goes missing, then you will check the pediatric ward. You'll check the wards at the hospital to see if a child is here because sometimes a child might be missing in Kingston, but for some other reason, they might end up at the Cornell Regional Hospital or a police station because they might have been now in conflict with the law. So these are some of the things that we're doing in you now spreading that reach so that immediately once a child goes missing, some of the pivotal areas that they're also checked to ensure that the children are not there. Mr. Smith says children need to be cautious in order to protect themselves from pedophiles and other child predators. We have tried to ensure that all methods are in place. We want to say to Jamaicans that we will now have to educate our children too on the information that children do post on social media, on Facebook. Um, you don't share information that I'm home alone or I'm going to a party, I'm going X place. Um, disclose your location that I'm home alone. Um, we encourage children not to share information on str with strangers who they have met on Facebook. And so to have that open relationship with their parents so that whatever is happening. So if they're going from school and going to the library and did not get permission, we, they, we then said to the children, inform someone to say that you're going to the library. So in, in the event, at least we can know that the last place you would have ventured was the library. But as the nation tries to find a remedy, there are those who will continue to do their part to flush scoundrels like child abusers out of our society. What message do you have for Jamaicans in, in how we go about protecting our children? For me, my message, I have a long message. And it's mostly dedicated to all these 
excuse me. <clears throat> I'm clean my throat for that one day. For all of them, like a pervert man, they. the nasty man, they have trouble with girl Pitney. They need to stop it. Leave a look up Pitney, make them grow up. Make them see them future. Make them shine. You don't know what tomorrow will be for them. We are tell them no go there. That's a part of our campaign. And trust me, I will be a big, big part of their life if they ever touch a girl child and I know you. And their message to children who have been abused? Don't be afraid. And why we tell them don't be afraid? There are lots of adolescents who are male and female who are being abused. But because they're afraid of the stigma and the discrimination, they don't talk about it. They're like, okay, so if I tell somebody that somebody's gonna tell another person, it's just gonna be a big rumor about me and there's nothing, you know, no comfort towards me, nobody to say, look, let me help you out of this situation. But if you talk, it's gonna hurt because if you're constantly keep on talking about it, when it just, especially when it just happened, you don't know who to trust, it's gonna be hard. And yes, you're gonna have struggles, but you just need to not be afraid, you just need to talk up. Because if you want to talk up, people are gonna just say no, say me, I'm gonna just deal with this because it got, it's, it's gonna be like a pain in the ass for them. It's gonna be so annoying. They're gonna be like, okay, I have no choice but to just help this child out of the situation. And even when you go to the law, the law are gonna give you some long story, a long process for you to wait because my case with my previous stepfather took me four years. And that is a big bottleneck in the, in the society, so to say. So it will take a while, yes, because the matter is that they lack of resources, whether natural or whatever resources they lack of. But you just have to be strong. You just have to just talk. As these survivors continue to fight for the protection of children, they hope child abusers and potential child abusers will see the hurt they have caused and can cause. They are also hoping that the authorities will do as promised and work relentlessly to rid our society of the vile and inhuman practice which continues to destroy the innocence of so many and damage the moral fabric of our society.